My youngest brother's name was, unfortunately, was Milton. And uh, he had gotten a pair of, on his bar mitzvah or something, he'd gotten a pair of rubbers. I mean regular rubbers, you know, the kind... <laughs> The kind you wear on your feet. <laughs> I have a different name for them now, I guess. Anyway, we used to call him gumshoes because he would never wear the rubbers if it was raining because he didn't want to get them wet. <laughs> He's a real shrewd guy. <laughs> then we shortened it to Gummo, and that's his name, and we still call him Gummo. My grandfather had been a magician in Germany, and my grandmother yodeled and played the harp. They traveled from town to town in a covered wagon. They came to America, a harper learned to play the harp. And my grandmother's harp, which was about this big, and was worth at least $35. <laughs> he found it in the closet. He was self-taught because he was a natural musician, Harpo. He once tried to take lessons, and he got a teacher over from the Metropolitan Opera House. And the teacher came in, and he said to Harpo, he said, uh, well, let me hear you play something. And Harpo started to play those roles that he did. And the teacher said, that's real good. He says, could you teach me that? I'll give you $10. <laughs> but he could play any instrument play the flute, he could play the clarinet, he could play the piano. He was a very talented musician. And Checo was always short of money, and he used to hock my father's shears. So whenever my father made a suit, of course it didn't fit. And the shears would be hanging up in the pawn shop in 94th Street. Get that 94th Street, eh? Kind of a strange pronunciation, isn't it, for a guy that's been in California for 35 or 40 years. Foy Street. Huh? Well, that's the way they called it in Brooklyn, in the Bronx. Still has a few survivors here in the East. I guess. <laughs> Chico got a job at Clobber Horn and Company. They used to manufacture paper different kinds of paper. And Chico, on Saturday, when they got paid, they used to have a crap game in the cellar. And Chico never brought home his salary, because he was always in the pool room, or he was someplace, and he never brought a salary. My father said, if you come home one more week without bringing me your wages, I'll kill you. Well, he lost his money again that day in the crap game. Now, he saw a big bundle there. It looked like something that you, you'd wrap a cotton in, you know, or like a, a bale of cotton. So he decided to bring that home. And he told his father, he lugged this thing all the way up in the streetcar, up to 93rd Street, which is where we lived. And they had a sale on, on paper. So Harpo Chico took this paper and brought it home. It was toilet paper. <laughs> and we'd never had toilet paper up to then. <laughs> we used to use the morning world. <laughs> when they went out of business, we used the Herald Tribune. If had we we been out here, we'd have used the Chronicle. <laughs> I used to smoke it, too. <laughs> By this time, you must realize that we were a pretty strange family. I had one uncle, Uncle Herman. He was a chiropodist. He used to come to our house, and for 25 cents, he'd cut your toenails. Or your throat, if that was handier. <laughs> in the winter, he worked in the Catskills. He got a fire, he got a job up there burning down hotels <laughs> for the insurance company. 
And he was very good at this. And he finally got promoted, so he was up in the Adirondacks, where the hotels were much bigger. And he did a great job up there, except the cops caught him one day and put him in Sing Sing for five years. Last time I saw him, he was a cashier in the bank, in the Bank of America, I think. I was named Julius after my uncle Julius, unfortunately. My mother thought he was rich. <laughs> he didn't have a quarter. And he lived with us for about 15 years. And my father always wanted to throw him out of the house. And my, my mother would say, no, I've heard of stories like this where you have a man that lives with you even though he's a stranger. And when he dies, he leaves you his money. Except that Uncle Julius didn't have any money. Or he finally did croak. And his will consisted of a celluloid dickey, an eight ball, and three razor blades. And besides that, he owed my father $85. So that's how I got the name of Julius. My first love was Annie Berger. She lived above me in the crummy apartment house we lived in, in 93rd Street in New York. She had a great pair of legs. I used to wait for her day to come from school, and I would watch her walk up the stairs, just so I could see her legs. I would still do it if she was around. <laughs> and my mother used to send me to the store every day to get a loaf of bread. And bread was a nickel. But I used to cheat, and I used to get a bread that was a day old. It was four cents. And I saved my money, and I finally had, uh, had 70 cents. So I said to Annie Berger, with the great legs, I said, Annie, why don't I take you to the theater? That was Hammerstein's Victoria in 42nd Street. And I figured it out. I had 10 cents for car fare to go to the theater and 50 cents for two seats in the theater. Now, the seats were way up in the gallery someplace. And before we got in the theater, there was a guy outside selling taffy. And she said to me, Julius, I would love some taffy. <laughs> well, I had bought the tickets. I only had 10 cents left. I couldn't see the show because we were up so high in the gallery. All I could hear was her chewing on that taffy. <laughs> and all I could think of during the show was, how am I going to get back to 93rd Street where I lived? <laughs> because by this time, I only had a nickel left. And it was 10 cents on the streetcar, a nickel for her and a nickel for me. So when we came out of the theater, I said to her, Annie, I said, it was snowing too by, by this time. I said, Annie, who had the candy in the theater? She said, I did. You know, you didn't even offer me a piece of that candy. All I could hear was you chewing that candy. I couldn't even hear the actors on the stage. Now look, I want to be fair with you. <laughs> we only have five cents left between us. But I'm a sport, and I'll toss up a coin. You holler heads, if it comes down heads, you ride home in the streetcar. If it comes tails, you walk home to 93rd Street. Well, it came tails, and it was snowing, and she had a walk from 42nd Street to 93rd Street. <laughs> you know, she didn't speak to me again for 10 years. <laughs> but I loved her at the time. <laughs> Soon we were in vaudeville, and I was a German comedian with a spade beard, 
I was dressed like my uncle Al Sheen with Gallagher and Sheen in those days. That was my mother's brother. And we were playing in Shays, Toronto when the Lusitania was sunk in the First World War. I was supposed to sing a song, a German song. But I was afraid if I did, they were going to kill me, that audience, because this was in Canada. I'm going to sing the song for you now. I once knew a woman who couldn't spell cat. Her face was as homely as singed. In winter, she always wore last summer's hat. And a size 11 shoe was a pinch. When she played piano, strong men would faint, and weak men would cry out in grief. And as for her singing, well, it made you feel that it, it wasn't so tough to be deep. <laughs> but with all these things that the people could say, her voice and her looks couldn't drive them away. Because, oh, how that woman could cook. Her bread was like angel fool's cake. She could take soup meat and give it one look, and right away it was porterhouse steak. Her Fannekuchen, what a beautiful dream. Her tripe was like peaches and cream. And with a table between us, she looked exactly like Venus. Oh, God, how that woman could cook. You must remember, this time we were playing in Canada, and the Lusitania had been sunk by the Germans. And I was afraid if I sang a German song, they would shoot me too. So I put on a, a little beard, and I put some makeup here, and I put some makeup here, and I became a Jew comedian. <laughs> so I sang a Jewish song, which was written by Irving Berlin. Isn't he well trained? <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Klein. They lived a life so fine until the relatives came. Uncle and Tante Wolf, but although the little wolves, like wolves, they lived up to their name. <laughs> One week when by clients started to cry, it looks like the wolves mean to stay. So he told his wife one night that while they were sleeping tight, Let's leave them and we'll run away, say. It's better to run to Toronto than to live in a place you don't want to. With 20 wolves in front of me, my house looks like a menagerie. Imagine the cheek from the Tanta to bring all the wolves from Toronto and oi how they could eat at least a pound of meat, say. They take what they want, that they want to. Just think what the bills will amount to. Every day they're growing more and more. They eat one meal a day, that's right. They start in the morning and finish at night. It's going to be a cold, cold winter. And I can't keep the wolves from the door. Ah. I used to spend a lot of time in England. This was about uh, 15 years ago. The American ambassador liked me and invited me to dinner. And one night I met Jackie Onassis' sister, who was married to a guy named Razowell. He was well over four feet, this guy. <laughs> Since I was making a play for his wife, I told him a story about a Hungarian officer who was a 
a hooker. And there were no picked up by a hooker. And she takes them home. And she feeds them. She showers them. She went to bed with them that night. Gave them the full treatment. <laughs> Next morning she gave him breakfast. Helped him with his uniform. And he starts to leave. And she says, just a moment, just a moment. What about money? And he says, a Hungarian officer doesn't accept money. <laughs> Remember that, you fellas. <laughs> One night at the embassy, Winston Churchill's daughter, Mary, was my dinner partner. And when the butler passed around the cigars, he said, take one for me. I said, what? What do you want a cigar for? You don't smoke cigars, do you? She said, no, my father does, Winston. And we play a little game. I said, well, what kind of a game? He was the brother, head of the British government at that time. He says, I take a cigar, and he takes a cigar, and then he bets me a pound, I think it was around two and a half dollars. And we bet who can hold the ash on the cigar the longest. At this time, he was running the British government. <laughs> no, you never think of a man like that. <laughs> Trying to win two bucks from his daughter. I don't know, it's a way back, I don't know if you remember, but uh, during the Second World War, Hitler was losing the war, and he had sent a man named Hess, and I think he's still alive, living, I think. No, I guess now he's dead. <laughs> but he, he wasn't living, so he was living just a few years ago. And Hitler had sent him over, Hess, he had sent Hess over to Churchill to see if they could stop the war. And the, uh, the plane that he sent him in crashed in Scotland. And they found out it was Hess and that he was on his way to see Churchill. So they took him to uh, 10 Downing Street and Churchill was in the projection room. And an orderly said to him, Mr. Churchill, we've just captured Hess in Scotland. Hitler sent him over here. What should we do with him? And Churchill says, bring him back in an hour. I'm rushing monkey business. <laughs> I had a great friend in England. It was about 15 years ago. His name was T.S. Eliot, the poet. <laughs> well, there are people out here who might not know that he was a famous English poet. As a matter of fact, he was born in St. Louis and moved to England. And I got acquainted with him. God, he wrote me a letter and he said, I'd like a picture of you with a cigar on it. You know, one of these. So I sent him a picture of me, and he retained it. He says, I want a picture of you smoking a cigar. So I sent him one smoking a cigar, and we got very well acquainted. I had dinner at his house. I met his wife. And I had read up on T.S. Eliot, Mitre in the Cathedral, and a few things like that. And I thought I'd impress him. And all he wanted to talk about was the Marx Brothers. That's what happens when you come from St. Louis. <laughs> well, he was a wonderful man. He was a great friend of mine. But eventually, he died. 
And at the National, the National Theater in London, they had a great memorial, and Mrs. Elliot had asked me to go on the stage and say a few words about her late husband. And I thought of all these actors that they had there, all the great Shakespearean actors, and I was an old actor from Vaudeville. So I said, well, I'll go over to the theater and take a look at it anyhow. I'm not going to go on with all the stars they have there. So I went in around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the stage door was locked, and I went through the front of the theater, and I walked down the aisle. And there was Stygian darkness there, and I couldn't see anything. I don't see too well anyhow. Is there anybody out front? <laughs> At any rate, I finally felt my way down to the front row. And I sat down. And I'm now sitting on... I can't think of his name. <laughs> It'll come to me in a couple of hours. <laughs> Did I sing, Oh, How That Woman Could Cook? No, it was true. I was sitting, sitting on Kenneth Tynan's lap. He has that naked show in New York, where they do everything on the stage that normally people used to do in the bedroom. Well, after that, I could do anything up there, and they laughed at it. Well, I walked away with the show with all the Shakespearean actors. Speaking of Waterville, there used to be a critic in Chicago when we played there by the name of Percy Hammond. This is about 30 years ago, I guess. He was on the Chicago Tribune. And he reviewed our act. We did a big act, and we had about 25 people in the act. And he reviewed the act. And the next morning, this was the review. He said, the Marx Brothers and their various relatives ran around the stage for almost an hour yesterday afternoon. <laughs> Why, I'll never understand. Anderson and Santa Clara, what are you doing after the show tonight? I, w I wish I was doing what, I was, what I'm hoping I was doing. And this one's from But Kate it's too late. This one's from K.T. Katchik. What haven't you done that yet that you want to do? What haven't I done? Yeah. You mean in the last three weeks? <laughs> Good one here. Groucho, are you thrifty? Am I what? Are you thrifty? Thrifty? Yes. You mean like a drugstore? <laughs> yes, I'm thrifty. What am I? I think we should. We're not helping in any right now. <laughs> They're going to run a piece of A Night at the Opera, and I'm going to sit down. Everybody works but Father. He sits around all day. Feet in front of the fireplace, smoking his pipe of clay. Mother night takes in washing, so does Sister Anne. Everybody works in our house, but my old man. And it was such a big hit, this song, that they sang it all over the world. They sang it in Germany, and it went like this in Germany. In Rauch, die verdammte Pfeife, das alles geht rüber und rum. Mutter nimmt den Waschen, auch zu Schwester an. Alle arbeiten in unser Platz, 
aber nicht der alte Mann. So my friend Harry Ruby got sick of all these songs about mothers. And so he wrote a song called Father's Day. Today, Father is Father's Day. And we're giving you a tie. <laughs> it's not much you know. It is just our way of showing you. We think you're a regular guy. You say that it was nice of us to bother, but it really was a pleasure to fuss. For according to our mother, you're our father, and that's good enough for us. Good enough for all. Okay. During the Second World War, there was so many wars. Still one going on. Thank the next one. Remember he was going to stop it three years ago? Well, we got a good vice president coming up. up. And we were playing in Minneapolis. And they didn't have a big theater like this there, so we played at the, at the railroad station. <laughs> All the stars went on and did a little bit. And they went off. Then it was my turn to go on. And I said to the audience, I says, I knew a girl in St. Paul. I used to call her the Taylor Two Cities. The manager came to me after the show and asked me not to go on anymore. <laughs> Sat the devil talking to his son who wanted to go up above up above He said it's too slow for me down here and so the devil said, listen, lad, listen to your dear old dad. You stay down here where you belong. <laughs> the folks who live above us, they don't know right from wrong. To please their kings, they've all gone off to war. And not a one of them know what they're fighting for. Way up above, they say that I'm a devil and I'm bad. But the kings up there are bigger devils than your dad. Damn breaking the hearts of mothers, making butchers out of brothers. You'll find more hell up there than there is down here below.
What's the greatest thrill you've ever had? Losing my virginity. <laughs> <laughs>